Welcome to the first lecture on The Great Gatsby. In this lecture, I want to cover two things. First of all, I want to talk briefly about the shift from American realism to American modernism. And second of all, I want to talk about The Great Gatsby as a work of American modernist fiction. I'm going to throw a couple of ideas up on the board, things that we've talked about as a way of starting the discussion about what modernism is and how it is a reaction to previous modes of American aesthetics. The Romantics tended to populate their fiction with unusually willful individuals, uh, characters with uh, peculiar ambitions, and also non-centrous plots. For example, in Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado, Montressor, the narrator, is trying to kill uh, Fortunato, his townsman. That's a, I'd say that's a, a fairly good example of the type of characters and plots that you tend to find in romantic fiction. The realist, in turn, they have an antagonistic aesthetic. They would like to push aside the romantic aesthetic and replace it with the dominant form of realism. The concept of realism, boiled down um, as a review, is this. Well, by the time we get up to the second half of the 19th century, there are enough uh, writers and editors and readers in the country and people reading American fiction outside of America so that there is the idea that American literature can be a way of preserving and documenting authentic American life. And so the realist would like to have um, regional American settings that represent true American life. They would like to have centrist characters, that is, common average characters. And Huck Finn, um, you have a pretty good representation of the social strata of St. Petersburg in that book. You have a couple people who seem to be wealthy, such as the judge. You have a number of middle class characters, such as um, the widow Douglas. And then you have a few characters that are flat out poor, such as Huck and his father. Realism would also like to put forward straightforward, um, authentic plots. They want to have stories cobbled together out of the actual material of average American life. And so Huck Finn, at its core, is the story of a young boy who is um, beginning a voyage towards manhood, looking around his corrupt culture and trying to find a place for himself there as an adult. This is a very common plot, the type of plot that most people go through at some point in their life. Well, the thrust of the argument as realism as the better of the two aesthetics is mainly this, that realism is more authentic, that it's better representative, and it is a way to document objective life in America. By the time we get up to the 20th century, there's uh, two large problems for the realists. The first is more substantial than the second one. The first problem is this. Um, people start to see human life as more complex than they did in the 19th century. Well, first of all, Darwin comes along and puts forward the theory that man is not a unique creature, but just a more complex animal. Um, quantum theory puts forward the idea that the universe is more complex than originally believed. But most significantly, Sigmund Freud says that humans are not in charge of their own desires. Um, they don't understand their own actions. And that each person is a unique individual who perceives the world um, in a unique fashion based on his or her experiences. That is, the past is the filter through which the present is understood. And so, well, if this class um, took place 150 years ago, and I were to ask, you know, Johnny, do you see the same world as Tim? And Johnny would say, well, of course I do. We all see the world the same way, because the objective world was believed to be knowable. And, you know, if you didn't see the world the same way as Johnny or Tim, you would be crazy. By the time we get up to the early part of the 20th century, um, that idea is pushed aside, primarily because of Freud. We can't see the objective world anymore. It exists out there, you know. There is an objective world that's filled with, you know, uh, chairs and tables and buildings and trees. It's there. 
The objective world has people. The objective world has relationships between people. The problem here is, in terms of realist literature, we can't know it. We can no longer know the objective world. And so at its core, realism was trying to present in literature, through language, a mimetic, a photographic representation of reality. It was trying to encode into language the components of objective reality. By the time we get up to the beginnings of the 20th century, we no longer believe that that's a possibility. We can't know objective reality. All we are capable of understanding is our unique subjective understanding of what's happening out there in the world. And so, you know, today, if I were to ask, you know, Johnny, Johnny, you see the same world the same way as, as Tim? Johnny would say, of course not. I see the world, um, I see the world, perceive the world, I understand the world based on the things that I've learned, my unique belief system, a series of past experiences. That's how I create meaning of the world around me. That's how I choose to focus on this thing as opposed to that thing over there. And so, though there are um, unlimited stimuli out there in the world, the things that we focus on and how we interpret them is based on those things that have already happened to us. And so, by the time we get up to the 20th century, the fundamental ambitions of realist fiction are no longer possible. Fiction can no longer capture the objective world because people can't see the objective world. And so we have an interesting thing happen by the time we get up to the 20th century. We've had two strong, lengthy American aesthetics of fiction. Both of them have failed. The romantics have fallen out of favor. The realists have fallen out of favor, well, primarily because the concept behind realistic fiction is no longer believed valid. The realists have another problem. If um, this is a representation of, uh, of uh, circles of human strata and so on, if, and here's the average man and out here towards, uh, towards the border of, of civilization are unique people. Well, realism has favored people at the center. The second problem for realism is this. Um, it doesn't cover really all of American life. It privileges those people closest to the center. And beyond that, there's a practical problem. The plots that you find there at the center, they're interesting once or twice. But the plot of maturity, of growing up like Huck Finn, after you've seen it over and over again, loses some of its appeal. In the short story by Mary Wilkins Freeman, The Revolt of Mother, the plot revolves around a man and his wife arguing over how to spend limited household funds. And these types of plots limit the drama. And so what we start to see at the um, beginning of the 20th century is we see, I'm gonna erase this here, we see the return of some aspects of romantic fiction. In the book The Great Gatsby, we have a romantic character. We have Jay Gatsby. And when I talk about Jay Gatsby as being a romantic character, I don't mean that he's in love with Daisy. That's not what I mean by romantic. I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about that Jay Gatsby exists at the fringe of human existence. He is a bootlegger. Um, he has amassed uh, incredible wealth very quickly. He is um, a social liar. Uh, he is a person who believes that he can, through the accumulation of wealth and hopefully the elevation of stat status, go back and recapture the love of his youth. Well, this person sounds much more like that uniquely willed person that we would have seen in a story um, by Edgar Allan Poe than in someone that has an average American experience, such as in uh, Huck Finn. Um, and so we do see some of these characters coming back. We also see elements of realism in play. There's a lot of straightforward mimetic uh, details in, in The Great Gatsby. And so we see some components of realism coming back into play. Another one we see is that 
Um, this book trusts the reader to interpret dialogue um, and gesture in a way that was very familiar to realist fiction. And we see one more thing, one thing that we haven't seen before. Modern fiction is going to try to add something new, is going to cobble together some aspects of the romantic tradition, some aspects of the realist tradition, and add some things to it. By the time we get up to Fitzgerald's life, uh, his publishing life, let's say in the 1920s, there has been a century of American fiction. When we started out this course and we were talking about um, people like uh, Hawthorne or Washington Irving, they didn't have strong mentor figures in American, in American literature. American fiction was new. They were still figuring out how to, ways to distribute it. Um, and so the concept of producing an American short story or an American novel was a new concept. By the time we get up to the 1920s, well, Fitzgerald has a whole century of mentor figures to rely upon. Um, he can go through uh, hundreds of books trying to understand what components of the American canon can be useful in creating a new type of work. This new type of work, um, uh, let's say, has two strong trends. I'm going to bring in a book that's uh, not specifically on our syllabus uh, by William Faulkner called The Sound of the Fury. One of these trends is going to say, well, if language can't, if language can't observe the objective world, this is the problem here. Language is no longer believed possible to hold the objective world. Well, what can language authentically hold? People such as James Joyce, uh, Virginia Woolf, William Faulkner are going to put forward this idea. Language is not that which that holds the objective world. Language holds the subjective world. And so for these authors in some of their books, the way that they present this newness in literature is through a stream of consciousness. Um, people, you know, think in images, people think in sounds, people in large part, I think, think with words. And so what Faulkner does is he tries to use um, narration to approximate the thought processes of his characters. And so for Faulkner, in The Sound of the Fury, let's say this is um, Benji here, the point of narration is going to be deeply inside of Benji's, uh, Benji's mind. The narration is not going to describe the outside world directly. It's only going to talk about how Benji's minds work, his perceptions, his memories at the moment. The language is going to give us a stream of fluid thought that approximates how Benji Compson thinks during the scene. The um, book has four sections. Each of them focuses on one of four members of the Compson household. The first one takes place on April 7, 1928, and it focuses on Benji. This is his 33rd birthday. Um, Benji um, has the thought capacities of a, of a five-year-old. He requires a caretaker. Um, in the book, it refers to uh, Benji is having a, a limited consciousness. And so our narration here is going to pull us down into this person that has the ability to think um, like a five-year-old about that level of complexity. And it's going to make us perceive the world through this unique subjective consciousness. This is how it works. Benji doesn't understand what he sees. He can um, perceive images but he can't always interpret them. He's out in a field with his caretaker, an African-American young man named Luster, um, and they are looking for a quarter. Um, and that's where our narration starts off. I'm just here at the uh, beginning of the book. Faulkner just throws us in, puts us in the cage of Benji Compson. Um, his consciousness traps us in there for about 70 pages um, and it allows us to uh, stumble and muscle our way um, to find meaning, as Benji does in his own circumstance. I'll read you a page or so, and you can get a feel for how this is the language of thought. If language can't capture the exterior world, Faulkner's, 
concept is that language then can capture thought. Through the fence between the curling flower spaces, I could see them hitting. They were coming toward where the flag was, and I went along the fence. Luster was hunting in the grass by the flower tree. They took the flag out, and they were hitting. They put the flag back, and then went to the table, and he hit, and the other hit. Then they went on, and I went along the fence. Luster came away from the flower tree, and we went along the fence, and they stopped, and we stopped, and I looked through the fence while Luster was hunting in the grass. Here, Caddy, he hit. They went way across the pasture. I held the fence and watching them go away. Listen at you now, Luster said. Ain't you something 33 years old going on that way? After I done, went all the way to town to buy you that cake. Hush up that moaning. Ain't you gonna help me find that quarter so I can go to the show tonight? They were hitting little across the pasture. I went back along the fence to where the flag was. It flapped on the bright grass and trees. Come on, Lester said, we done looked there. They ain't no more coming right now. Let's go down to the branch and find the quarter before the niggers finds it. It was red flapping on the pasture, then there was a bird slanting and tilting on it. Luster threw, the flag flapped on the bright grass and the trees. I held to the fence. Shut up that moaning, Luster said. I can't make them come if they ain't coming. Well, this scene, what's happening out there in the exterior world, is Benji, who is 33 years old today, is with Luster, and he is watching a group of men play golf. He doesn't understand the rules of golf. He doesn't even understand that that is what it's called. And so we get descriptions as he was understand that. He can see a flag being pulled out, being put back into the sod. He can see a man hitting. He hit, the other hit, and so on. One of the men keeps calling for his caddy to get a different club. Um, but what Benji hears, he doesn't know that that person is called a caddy. What he hears is here caddy, and that's going to be the nickname of his sister. And so he hears here caddy, this person that used to take care of him. Well, that's one approach to figure out how to make a novel authentic. Can't capture language out there, can't get to the exterior world. But language might be able to capture realistically how things work out here. Fitzgerald um, is not part of the stream of consciousness tradition. Fitzgerald and other people like him, such as uh, Hemingway, are going to put forward a different aesthetic, um, a different modernist aesthetic in how language works in literature. And that aesthetic is this. Language is subjective. Language can't capture reality. But language is the beautiful means by which one person's orientation or vision of the exterior world is presented on the page. If you think of Thomas Aikens as a type of American realist painter who is trying to capture with strong mimesis scenes of, uh, of America, contemporary America, um, well, just think of Mary Cassatt. She's also trying to capture images, uh, contemporary images. But her images, just a little bit later than Eakins, are influenced by an early wave of this uh, modernist concept. And this wave's informing her work so that, well, mimesis, this photographic representation, is no longer as important, but it is transformed by a singular vision into a new, subjective, beautiful image. And so for painters such as Cassatt, what matters then is how this real image, this image from the objective world is transformed by one person into a painting. So things that are important, uh, color selection, uh, brush stroke, how paint is layered on a canvas, the components of the painting, the actual, the actual act of painting becomes important. And we see that same type of aesthetic going on in Fitzgerald's novels. Fitzgerald is a um, beautiful um, uh, prose stylist. He has breathtaking descriptions. What he is doing here is he's taking this image of realistic New York, objective New York, and is transforming it into the Valley of Ashes, into East Egg and West Egg, into individual achingly stunning um, lines of description. 
So if the real world becomes something slightly different, it is transformed by the way that Nick Carraway describes it in this novel. And so for Fitzgerald, the way that his novel becomes new is this transformative effect of the prose. For someone like Fitzgerald, the way the novel becomes new, a new presentation of reality, is that the prose becomes the approximation of thought language. Let me give you two other ways that the great Gadsby puts forward a new aesthetic, this aesthetic of modernism, how it, how it includes that. Um, the first of it is this. The great Gadsby, um, unlike Huck Finn, acknowledges this um, subjectivity. Huck Finn, Huck Finn experiences 99% of that story. Um, he has first-hand knowledge of most everything that's included in that book. And so that story is, is assembled from personal experience. Huck Finn owns the reality of that story in that book. He sees almost everything. In this book, Nick Carraway does not see almost everything. Nick Carraway works as an editor, compiling the experiences of other people, plus that of himself, into The Great Gatsby. And so for long sections, Nick Carraway relies on the information that Jordan Baker has to give us a background of Daisy and uh, Jay Gatsby. Nick Carraway relies on the information that Gatsby has in those last few chapters to fill in information about his boyhood and information that concerns Gatsby and Dan Cody. Um, Nick Carraway relies on information that Daisy has, as well as the things that he's seen himself. And so he doesn't own the story. He doesn't own that external experience. It is collected from many subjective sources. That's one of the ways that we start to see modernism at work in this book. And the other, I think, very obvious way that we see modernism at work in this book is that Huck Finn, when he begins his story, he, he comes forward with this paragraph-long introduction in which he explains that there are problems with books. People like Mark Twain tell stretchers, whereas he, Huck, is going to offer the authentic version of life in St. Petersburg, Missouri, before everyone starts to move downstream. Well, Nick Carraway has a very different introduction in his book. The first few pages explain to us who Nick Carraway is. Nick Carraway has a good education. He comes from money. He's been told by his father to delay judgment on other people because he's had certain advantages. Well, why is this section here? Well, other than to um, tell us who the character is so that we understand how to interpret experience once it happens, Nick Carraway is expressing that idea of subjectivity or unreliability. He's saying, I'm going to tell you what I've seen and how I interpreted it, why it matters to me. I don't own objective reality out there. I've just seen these things and these, this is why they're meaningful to me. This is my subjective filter. I come from privilege. I come from high education. I come from um, uh, liberal parents. He is giving us these touchstones to let us know exactly how this filter of subjectivity is going to influence how he presents the story that is to follow. There are aspects of um, modern life in this book, too. Modern aesthetics, um, by modern aesthetics I mean the construction of the book, how the book is constructed in terms of narrative style, prose style, in terms of plot organization. Well, those things would include subjectivity and uh, how uh, uh, Fitzgerald uses the language with its transformative effect. There are also aspects of uh, modern life in here. Um, and so there is a, a, a lifestyle of modernism that, that goes on in this book. If you think of modernism existing roughly from 1910 through 1945, that is more or less encompassing the space between the two world wars. Um, uh -huh. There are aspects of the unique life style that exists in this book as well. Um, you start to see that uh, money, true wealth, large wealth is made not through the uh, production of crops or um, uh, the manufacture of goods or even the presentation of services, it's made through business deals. Um, you start to see the new American woman like George Baker who could be successful on her own without a, without a um, husband, um, without parents um, supervising her. You see uh, 
prohibition. You also see the, the large financial boom um, that follows uh, World War I in America. And those are lifestyle aspects of uh, the modern life. And we'll talk about those a little bit as we move forward. But at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to tra transition and look at three sections from chapter one.